It's just going up the side. I've just done some sky drink. I just need to taste it. Thank you. 
Good morning, everybody. If I can ask you to take your seats, please. Good morning, everybody, and, and thanks for being here today on this very wet morning and with the stress of viruses around us as well. So we very much appreciate your attention. My name is Sarah Ingle. I'm the uh, Secretary General of the Association of Consulting Engineers of Ireland, and we're a, a partner with CETA on, on many of its events and privileged to be involved with their work and everything they do nationally throughout the country. Um, I'm actually an engineer by profession, um, and I was actually the first woman to complete the production engineering degree course in what is now TU Dublin in Bolton Street. So this is very much um, speaks to my original training as a manufacturing engineer and my initial work. So I'm very privileged and delighted to be here this morning. Um, modern methods of construction, they're just going to be so key, so vital for our built environment. Um, all sorts of things that can be used that some of our speakers this morning will talk about. In Ireland in particular, as well as throughout the world, we're facing a skills shortage in, in the built environment sector. And there's increased workloads. We've got government bringing in new infrastructure programs, Project Ireland 2040. And throughout all of those, we need to improve productivity in the built environment and the construction sector. So we have to use digital technologies, and then we also have to use new ways of producing the um, products and services for the built environment. We need to improve quality, we need to improve safety and productivity. And using modern methods of production will help with all of that. Um, our speakers today will speak about those and will introduce you to their thoughts on how best to bring them into the built environment in Ireland. Um, we keep most of the questions until the end after the four speakers have spoken. But if you have a pressing question, do raise your hand or make yourself known to me if you want to ask something of a particular speaker. But otherwise, we'll keep going, and if you can save your questions till the end for the panel. Is that okay with everybody? All right, thank you. Okay, well, first of all, I'm delighted to welcome Ian Fewer. Ian is the MD of Fewer, Harrington and & Partner, and he has extensive local, national, and international architectural experience in the design and construction industry. Um, he's a chartered member of the British and Irish Royal Institute of Architects, He's really passionate about modular and off-site construction methods and the built environment. And what he's going to try and do for us today, what he will do today, is kind of to set the scene for what we're going to talk about in terms of the housing crisis, modular construction, and everything that goes with that. Thank you very much, Ian. 
Um, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure here to be here this morning. Um, I'll just get straight into it. Um, I suppose I'm going to start with a, a brief introduction. Um, housing in Ireland, uh, modular, and then moving on to modular housing, and then a short kind of case study or just an overview in terms of companies that are doing modular construction within Ireland and the UK, and um, just naming some companies. So just to um, uh, explain something about um, our, my own practice, um, obviously we're one of the leading architectural practices in Ireland, um, um, we have extensive residential experience and delivered 10,000 residential units over the probably the last probably 10, 10 15 years. Um, uh, we've also uh, 40 years of uh, being in practice and working on various different uh, projects uh, from housing to pharmaceutical to uh, hospitals to uh, education and so on. And um, um, probably going back maybe probably five, six years, we kind of focus a lot on, in terms of investigating modular solutions, uh, sorry, uh, fast track modular solutions. Um, in various different in the pharma industry and now obviously the housing industry is um, is looking it's a, obviously a key um, kind of um, uh, indicator at the moment so moving on so um just well, I want to start the presentation is in terms of kind of house ownership so um, Ireland obviously back before the, the previous recession was a huge kind of house ownership was very high and um, in my slide, I suppose the top slide, I suppose indicates house ownership and how it how it's dropped over the years, like right? um, to the present day. Um, the, the slide below it indicates, um, I suppose, the dotted line is house ownership in the UK, and the blue uh, indicates um, house ownership in Ireland. So you can see that house ownership has kind of risen faster in the UK than it has in Ireland. And then the, the lower slide indicates a comparison between Ireland and, the, U, and um, the USA. So Ireland is indicated in the dotted, red, uh, the dotted line on the, the lower chart and the US is the blue. So you can see how the US and the UK are kind of recovering a lot faster in terms of house ownership uh, rates. Um, you know, today I suppose, um, Home ownership has dropped, uh, soaring rent prices, homelessness, uh, homelessness climb, climbing, and shortage of housing. So um, we've done a kind of a comparison in terms of getting statistics from you know going back as far as 1990 in terms of um, uh, complete uh, houses that were complete and going through the years. So you can see back in um, I suppose 1990 they were just kind of just below 20,000 units a year, like and obviously it soared to back in in 2005 to around 88,000 units. And then obviously when you see 2009 and 11, it, it, it just fell off a cliff. Like. So uh, at the present day, um, at 2000, uh, 2019 figures, we're at 12,529 units, houses now, not apartments. Um, when you apply the apartment figure on top, it's higher, but just for houses, we're at that figure. Um, and you can see that the 35,000 units per year is what the government wants us to achieve and get to that kind of equilibrium in terms of the housing market. So uh, this um, uh, slide shows housing versus construction workforce. So the top uh, figures are supply of houses and the, the below blue figures are in terms of people working in the construction sector. So you can see, uh, as I said back in 2003, how you know it, it rose and then and, and then sharply, uh, sharply fell, and then how it's kind of slowly going back up, and how I suppose the workforce is there. I suppose the workforce figures are kind of slightly distorted because you know that's not just all for the residential industry. It's it's you know there's office commercial, you know the pharma, billing kind of intel and so on. So, but what you can see is that the workforce is kind of slowly filling back up, but it, it it's it's not solely towards um, the the residential uh, sector. So. Um, there was a kind of an article there over the weekend by Dermot Desmond. I don't know if people have read it, um, and and uh, this is just some information, some kind of extracts from that article. But according to the recent industry, like uh, twenty one thousand homes were constructed, uh, of which eight thousand um, were only available for sale, um, and uh, cast this, you know, in contrast, you know, to eighty thousand um, um, in terms of new job creations, and. Uh, and also the formation of new households are over 46,000. So we, we've got, it's a complete, it's, it's, we've got a long way to go within the housing sector going forward. And then the below is a, a chart from the um, Central Statistics Office 
in terms of the comparison of single dwellings over scheme, uh, which are kind of houses over apartments. So, we, you know, the government is obviously uh, saying it's 21,000 houses were, were completed this year, but you can see that, you know, I suppose there's 3,600 of them were associated with apartments and 5,000 were single dwellings in the country. So we've, we've still got a, quite a, a long way to go. So um, also in this article, they kind of mentioned, um, you know, kind of snapshot, like 5% of apartment, um, apartment buildings, um, uh, sorry, 5% of apartment buildings were available for purchase and 95, uh, uh, sorry, and only, sorry, only 5% were available for sale and 90 for, uh, went to institutional investors. Um, and then a total of 8,000 new homes slash apartments were available for sale. So you can, you can see, you know, the, 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 I suppose the challenges that we have and, um, and a lot of these built to rent schemes that are happening in Dublin. And really it's, it's kind of distorting the numbers in terms of people getting on that uh, the housing ladder. So um, factors affecting uh, the cost, like so on the house side, um, things that have, have attributed to rising kind of house prices. Um, so on the actual physical building side, Irish water uh, costs, planning, um, B car costs, uh, tax, uh, development contributions, shortage of skill, uh, shortage of uh, skill labourers, um, NZ requirements, uh, disposal of construction waste, and shortage of sites. So that's on the house that increased the, the, just the house costs. And then on the land side, then you have land tax, a shortage of zoned residential land, institutional investors buying up uh, large blocks of apartments and, and, and schemes, and then obviously land banking by developers, and then the rise of built to rent schemes. So um, what we've done is, in terms of looked at the, just analyzing the, the average kind of borrowing capacity and just comparing it from Waterford, say, to Dublin. Like, so in Waterford, the, the average is around 39,500. In Dublin, it's around it's 50,800. So when you apply uh, for a single person, when you apply that multiplier of 3.5 when you go to the bank, you know, that's, you know, 135, say 140,000 roughly in Waterford and 177 in Dublin, right? Um, and, and that's what you're talking about. So when, when you go across and you, you look at the shortfalls in terms of a single person, obviously many uh, properties are outside the reach of a single person and it'll have to be a couple that buys it. So that reduces the amount of quantity in terms of people who can actually get on the, you know, afford to buy a house and get on the housing ladder. So in Waterford, like, it, because obviously it hasn't moved as fast as, uh, as the Dublin market, it's slightly, slightly less at 48,000 of a shortfall. But in Dublin, you can see that it's a huge disparity there, like, I mean, 177,000 for one person. So, so there has to be ways in terms of how do we, how do we address that? You know, because um, banks are back, AIB and um, Bank of Ireland, they're all kind of meeting us about how, how do we deliver more houses? How, how can, they're pushing out the message that we're out here to do business. But I think my personal opinion, until the multiplier kind of changes slightly, and certain and houses get cheaper, you know, we're not going to get. We'll definitely we even get started on fixing um, the the housing issue in Ireland. So, um, and I suppose an increasing supply of private uh, market houses and buildings do not necessarily reduce the price and rent. Therefore, it's about um, about sorry, it's not about the supply, but it's about the the type of supply. So, this the solution alone is not built to rent or co living. So, uh, the figures that we've been shown by the government are quite distorted because there's a lot of built to rent schemes coming out within the Dublin market and it's kind of distorting in terms of what is available for sale. So it's, it's getting the right houses uh, for the public to buy and, and invest and move forward. So um, this is just the average. Uh, so just going back to, oh, sorry, I think I went backwards there, did I? Sorry. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so I suppose this slide is just bringing it forward to in terms of if, if we can if we can look at modular construction and um, there's ways to be more cost effective in terms of how we deliver our houses, it can reduce the house, the, the, the overall house price and then reduce the overall sales price of that house. So um, this is a company uh, that we're kind of, kind of working with at the moment, the UK, they're called I Like Homes and they're quite mm -hmm. established in the UK at the moment and, the, and, and they're, they've come up with kind of models making houses more efficient to build, a bit more co and cost effective. So they're saying a three bedroom house that they can deliver roughly for 65,000. That's just for the house now, that's not including 
the land and the site infrastructure costs and so on. So they're looking at ways of, of you know, making houses themselves more affordable and bringing them into the market and, 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 a, and a rapid um, uh, scale. So, as I said, modular housing is one part of the solution to solving the housing crisis. It's not the only, you know, there's many other issues that we have to resolve uh, to get on top of it. So, uh, what is um, modular construction? Uh, I suppose there's sexual, uh, sectional prefabrication uh, of, of houses, which is up, up above, and then you get the full volumetric, kind of almost uh, fully finished how, um, blocks that are built in factories and delivered to site. Um, I suppose, why do we need um, modular housing? I suppose cost efficiency, um, all, all, all this is done in factories, uh, less wastage, um, more kind of higher efficiency, done in kind of environmentally friendly, you know, in, in kind of large warehouses, so not wet dependent. Um, obviously time in terms of uh, that efficiency and also going on site, less on site time when you, when you get to site. Um, obviously the construction method, like so there's various different ways where it's CLT, which is a timber system, or like HDL or ICF or so on, they're all uh, different methods of uh, delivering. And then obviously the carbon footprint is important. So one of the, the key things is you can control more wastage on site, get more efficiency within the, the panels that you're building or the, the modules that you're building. Um, so I suppose what is the process of um, um, of modular construction. So um, I suppose you know, the first is of reproduction, um, like the slide up here, it's, it's, it's kind of done the same way in a, in, a, in, a, in a car factory. It's on a line and you know, it's different people complete the different, you know, the first fix, electric, uh, electric second fix and so on, it moves on and then, and then it pushes out down the factory and then it goes out the door. Um, obviously, obviously transportation is a big, um, component to modular and, uh, and, and it really dictates the size of the modular unit that you can you can go up to. So normally it's, I don't know, maybe four and a, I mean, just under five meters by maybe, maybe it goes nine or maybe 11 meters or 12 meters long, depending or possibly longer in some cases. And then the assembly on site. I suppose the assembly on site, you can see that it's, it's, it, it's very quick um, and and, and some products obviously um, have come with their external cladding on, on site, so it, it can be delivered within, when you're on site to be maybe two days, you could have your house up and running and um, ready to occupy. So what has, I says, why has modular housing haven't taken off in the past? This was that there is a perception out there that it's, it's low quality, it's, it's bad design, um, and, and that dates back to, you know, I suppose a, a long time. And that it's you know maybe you know not as energy efficient, but I, I suppose that's not the case these days. Um, I suppose why has modular taken? Uh, I suppose taken off. I suppose it's it's. I suppose there's also in Ireland um, there's economic of scale. So in the UK and other markets, it's it's a lot easier to kind of um, you have to be producing a lot of these units, like maybe at least 500 in terms of say full volumetric houses, and then you need the demand to supply that. So in larger markets, it probably suits it. And Ireland is, I suppose, it's, it's on the cups of kind of creating that demand uh, for companies to, uh, to fill it. Um, and I suppose, uh, I suppose there's also uh, planning, um, in terms of getting planning permissions through here, where it's, it's quite intensive. Um, uh, planners like to see not just one house type, they'd like to see a variety of different house types and uh, which, which I suppose I wouldn't say you can do in modular, but it, 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 it lowers the efficiency rate in terms of having multiple different house types. Um, so um, I suppose the advantages and disadvantages. Um, so the advantages are obviously speed of construction, indoor construction, low waste, environmentally friendly, uh, flexible, um, qua high quality and improved air quality. Uh, I suppose some of the disadvantages would be you know, transport flexibility, and the financial in terms of scale of production, you know, to be able to scale up to the numbers to make it uh, a viable business. Um, so like flexibility is a key part of it. Like, you know, it's, it's a bit more difficult to make, but you can't really kind of, in a lot of cases, make changes on site with a lot of these different systems. So um, just moving on to one of the last slides. So just talking about, there's, there's many different companies that are, um, I suppose, um, doing modular constructions at, at, at different type of offering different type of um, systems and 
uh, and so on. Like, uh, so as I said, yeah, we're, we're working with I Like Homes at the moment, uh, they're a UK company, and um, they've got a factory in the north of England, and they, they want to roll up to around 2,000 units a year and rolling out of that factory. And they're interested in the Irish market uh, for the obvious reasons. Um, Haas is another kind of small, kind of modular company, uh, Vision, uh, Urban Splash, and, and um, Mac, uh, Skystone, uh, MHI. These are just some of the companies that we, we know of and that we've talked to um, over the probably the last five years. Um, so um, Vision uh, are doing kind of multiple like 70 story buildings in London. Um, and that was kind of originally based from a kind of an Irish based kind of um, um, uh, company and which was then bought out. So just moving on to the, the last, and there's a small kind of video, uh, if I can get this to play. If that would play, maybe probably not. I don't know to, yeah. I don't have to press that. No, I just press the link. Is it? And if it opens up, it just gives you. It up. Sounds good. But it'll just give you an idea. Uh, it just shows um, the company that we're working with. I like in terms of their factory, but uh, it's it's a minute and a half, <laughs> and it shows you just you know a good impression of what a modular factory looks like, uh, how it operates if it opens up. Yeah, so here we And yeah, that concludes my presentation. So um, if anybody has any questions afterwards, uh, please uh, feel free to ask me some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. That was great to set the scene and actually then to see the video it really brings it home as to how powerful these modern methods of construction are. Um, I'd like to introduce John White to you. Um, John is from the BRE Group, who's the business development manager in BRE Global Ireland. And BRE is an international multidisciplinary building science organisation, and their mission is to improve building and infrastructure through research, knowledge generation, and application. Um, John is going to talk to us today about um, modern methods of construction, off-site and beyond. And I know John's key message might be today is collaboration, how we can all work together to make this happen better. John, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And um, first, the apologies. Um, sore voice from uh, being a long-suffering West Mead GA fan, so apologies for that. I'm going to keep it very brief, quick overview of BRE, why we're in Ireland, what we are doing from a testing and certification perspective in off-site, which is very important in the UK, what innovation we're doing with different companies, and also what's best practice, what's actually happening in the UK market. Um, one thing Ian mentioned earlier as well is about scale of production, and make no pretense, like modular is not the full solution to meet the housing crisis, but it's part of the solution. And if people go off in different directions, my view is it won't work. I think that's why the collaboration is really important. And I think the other part as well, and I, I think my colleague David Gall said at the event last year, is education and awareness about modular. There is that perception out there. And unfortunately, the likes of IKEA coming into the market in the UK kind of reinforces this. 
flat pack mentality as well, which really isn't true. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, this is our main campus in North Watford. So BRE is in existence since 1921 and was a government test laboratory. So we are basically a multidisciplinary organisation involved in the built environment. So that's everything from education and training to development standards to testing and certification, what goes into buildings. And the buildings could be a residential build or a data centre. And I suppose what, what we believe in, and this to me is really, really important in the core of what we do, we are looking for better and safer ways for people to live and work in. From a health and well-being perspective, obviously fire safety is critical. And one other thing that gets, gets lost in it as well is obviously what's affordable and also what's comfort factor. So we can go on a bit all modern methods of construction, but also the comfort aspects in the building as well, whether you're living and working is really important. Um, so as I mentioned, we were a government test laboratory up until 1997, then became privatised. So at the very top is BRE Trust, so it's, a, it's actually a UK registered charity. All the subsidiaries in Ireland, the UK, China are commercial. All the profit goes back into the trust for investment in education, development of standards, testing and certification. And we also fund a lot of research programmes through undergraduate and postgraduate colleges in the UK, Ireland and overseas. And I suppose from an expertise perspective, um, these are kind of the key areas we work in. And obviously a key area for us is fire safety. So a lot of people may be aware the day after Grenfell we were mandated by UK government and London Met Police to go and do fire investigation and high rise. And one thing that gets lost in all of this is fire investigation of defective buildings and witness assessment visits. And unfortunately, there's still bad practice going out there. And that's not just construction in the boom period, it's pre-boom and post-boom period as well. And unfortunately, we come across a lot of that in the UK and Ireland, not just in residential, but also in commercial. Where we are in the world, we're in 80 countries. We've set up in Ireland, and the main reason we've set up in Ireland is because of Brexit. Because we do testing to see marking, and it meant that any UK testing house had to have a test facility in an EU country. So since, um, since, night, since early, late 2017, we've been based in Ireland. But I suppose through all our collaboration with stakeholders, through academia, industry regulators, these are all the challenges we face in industry from production manufacturing, from construction, and from the property sector. And one or two key areas here I would say is really important is the gap between design and operational performance in the building and how do we address that. Cost obviously is a factor as Ian alluded to, but also then having proper assessment methodology in buildings, what is safe to live in, and kind of given that, um, allaying any concerns that maybe regulators or local authorities may have, particularly with modern methods of construction, because everyone goes on about the housing crisis and rapid build, and we have to build as many houses as quickly as possible, and that is no different to the UK, but that's great, but how safe is that building? And it's, it's a proper methodology in terms of the factory production controls that goes into that as well. And I suppose, as I said to you, from an Irish perspective, we're here, we're actually building a fire test laboratory here. Um, but one of the key areas here which I'll focus on today is off-site and also innovation. And that's really, really important. What works well, what doesn't work well. Um, and if you have early engagement and stakeholder involvement from manufacturers, from industry, from regulators, from regulators, it's successful and we'll, we'll show exactly what we've done in the UK from a testing and certification perspective. So apologies, some of these slides were also presented last year. Um, so one of the things BRE do in the offsite sector is not only do we test and certify the buildings and material that goes into offsite construction, but we've now developed a standard called BPS 7014. Um, apologies, I didn't come up with the name. <laughs> Sounds like C3PO or something from a, from a science fiction movie. But to us it's assessment methodology of what is best practice. And the idea behind it is when we looked at this at the beginning, we said, why do we need a standard? Who do we need to get involved? How is it different to what's in the marketplace already? The certification process, but also the testing process as well. So what we did was we looked at what, why do we need it in the first place? And you know, in the UK, for example, they need to build nearly 900,000 homes by next year, and they're not going to meet that target. In the Ireland, obviously, the long-term target is, is half a million homes. And to put that in international context, in Brazil, the target is 25 million homes to be built long term and most of them to be socially affordable houses so you can see the scale as you move up and repeat again what i said modern medicine construction offsite is a part solution to this in our view it won't obviously meet the whole and i think one of the key things is scale of production and um, ian mentioned as well you know this kind of misperception of offsite and and um, flat pack mentality and and um, when i show you our innovation park and what we do in the uk and internationally what we're planning for ireland and um, we have an innovation park with different types of build on it. And if you mention there's somebody coming along that maybe has little knowledge around modular and say, that's a modular. And I've seen this at first hand. The first thing they tend to do when they go in is jump up and down. Fact. 
And that's not just a person, that could be somebody from government or from a regulator's perspective as well. So but when you go into a building and you say nothing to them, and you, they come in and say, oh, that's a fantastic structure, we actually say, well, that's actually modular, that's offsite, that's volumetric construction. They're blown away. So again, it's, it's perception at the end of the day. On the left, there is a high-rise modular. Look, let's be honest, it aesthetically looks horrible. On the right is traditional build, but actually the right is actually modular build. So again, it's perception. What goes into the build, the methodology used as well. And that's what we face in the UK as we face in Ireland. So when we looked at developing the standard, we kind of wanted to, we didn't want something to compete in the marketplace already. So for example, the boat pass scheme, and explain how that's harm, how kind of how it complements the boat pass scheme. So we wanted to work with different partners to improve methodology. Obviously, from a compliance perspective, it's not only meeting the minimum regu building regulations, but goes way beyond building regulations as well. That's very important to us. Obviously, creating confidence in the marketplace, not just among manufacturers, but also among regulators and local authorities. And also identifying comfort and well-being and sh improving that to the house builder or the homeowner or, for example, somebody working in an office. So they were really key important points when we were developing the standards. And when we, we decided to, at the beginning, BRE don't know the whole world, we're not experts in this area. So early engagement to us is critical. So that's where we engage with the likes of building control in the UK, regulators, and obviously from financial and insurance perspective, warranty providers in the insurance sector as well. So all of these organisations came together to BRE to develop the BPS standard. And what we developed out of them was a technical committee to kind of, kind of focus on six key areas. So from a structural perspective, from a fire perspective, acoustics. When I say acoustic, that also includes noise pollution inside and outside the building as well. Health and well-being, sustainability, and quality management is really key as well. So this is a certification scheme. This is going into the manufacturer. How can they demonstrate that they're actually quality compliant from a factory production control perspective? And I suppose, why is it different to what's already out there? So I'm just sorry, I meant to say this, this presentation is fully available. And there's also linked there to the full technical guidance if anybody wants to download the BPS standard as well. It's a 78-page document. So some nice evening uh, leisure time to read that. Um, but the key thing for us from a stakeholder perspective, we try to map out all of these key areas to develop into the standards. So from a regulatory perspective, a BIM perspective, which is obviously a, a core team of seed as well. And going back to my point earlier on, to make sure minimal gap between design and operational performance as well, right to the resilience of the building, whether that's from a weather resilient perspective or fire resilient perspective, and obviously security as well what goes into the build in terms of doors and windows. But all of these are brought together to develop the standard as well. So the standard itself, and this is from a UK perspective, but I'll explain in, a, in an Irish context in a few moments, not only is it kind of meeting the seven core requirements of the construction product regulations in the UK, we also have developed what's called an industry plus. We're actually saying, well, we don't believe that's good enough. It actually should go beyond that. So as part of the testing and certification process as a standard, we look at things like three-dimensional testing of the build, racking, acoustic, and fire testing. We also structural testing of the build, particularly for high-rises. And um, Ian mentioned earlier on the example in Croydon. Um, currently at the moment, there's a student accommodation going up in Manchester, which actually be the highest rise modular. Um, we've been involved in that in terms of structural testing as well. And also mentioned BIM, BIM tagging, tracking, you know, making sure that everything is tagged and properly processed as well. And also, as I said at the beginning, is measuring the comfort aspects of the building as well. So that's kind of what we're doing, not just meeting, we're going way beyond the building regulations here. That's really, really important. And, you know, also I mentioned the BIM tag and tracking. So what we've done within this, we've actually put in a BIM logging process. So every item and every material that goes in is properly BIM tagged and tracked. So again, there shouldn't be any clash detection on the project. There shouldn't be any um, conflict between designer and up and construction side of the build as well. Um, and key thing as well is having one single source of truth. So there should be an online register of every manufacturer that goes through this process. So if a company in the world is, is looking to go out to tender, um, for example, they can actually go to an online register and say that manufacturer is actually complying to this standard, as an example. So that kind of single source of truth methodology. Um, as I said, we, within, within BRE in the UK, we do large scale testing as well. So for high rise builds, we do it a lot around dynamic load tests and structure testing of the building as well. Um, so, in an Irish context, just to put this in, in what we're planning, so the standard at the moment is specific to UK residential. The next stage is we're developing it for the likes of education, commercial and data centres in the UK. The third stage is we are looking to run it as a pilot scheme in Ireland for residential um, as well. So, and we don't believe there's a huge amount of work from our end to actually make that compliant to Irish building regulations to Part B, Part L, Part M. But we need, we need engagement from people on the ground here. 
we're not experts in building regulations, and that's why I'm throwing it out to here and to other organisations that if we if we can we can actually develop this as a standard and proof of methodology around modular and give 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 assurance to the government because that's at the end of the day we can talk all we want about modern methods of construction, rapid build, but unless something's not compliant or fire safety or health from a health and wellbeing perspective, you're not going to get buy-in from the regulators. So the certification process itself is um, threefold. We, we go in, it's, it's like an ISO certification. It's a kind of three-year process. So we go in and do an initial on-site audit, look at factory production controls, or if a company's ISO 9000 and one compliant, look at their testing processes, and then we go through the certification process. So we would go in and do the initial testing as the certification body, BRE. We go in and do look, look at the an assessment of the FPC, and then there's ongoing audit testing. So Great catch certification in year one, but then next year we go and do an on-site visit to not just the manufacturing facility, but also where they've actually brought that from manufacturing plant into residential development, for example. And then that's ongoing for three years to go through a recertification process again. But more importantly as well, that goes on to a global online listing. So I'm going back to my earlier point that we would hope this would be a single source of truth for a modular or for any manufacturer or for any client looking to deal with a manufacturing company. Um, Demonstrating compliance is really key, declaration of performance, um, but the key thing for us is, is continual assessment. This is just not a one-off certification, the continual assessment is built into it as well. Um, I mentioned earlier on, we don't believe, and this is why we brought stakeholders together, so we wanted to make sure it wasn't competing. And I can only speak from a UK perspective, obviously people are aware of the BOPAS scheme, which is very much an assessment scheme around durability process of producing modular and online listing. So this to us is actually a complements both pass and in fact they're one of the key stakeholders in this. This goes beyond that in terms of certification, factory production controls. Um, so we see a complement of what both pass is doing as well. And we see no reason why this couldn't be developed in harmonization with potentially what's in the marketplace here already. Um, I mentioned about innovation and um, there's, there's two ways to look at innovation. If you're sitting as a government, sometimes innovation is seen as risk. You know, you are, that's, that's good because you're a regulator, you want to make sure everything's compliant. But for us, innovation is what works well, what doesn't work well. That's the idea behind innovation. Um, and go through best practice, and sometimes it's very successful, other times you have to go back to square one. So in BRE, um, we've developed, we've done a lot of testing certification of building material products within the building. So about 15 years ago, we built an innovation park in Watford. This is a snapshot of part of the build. So basically, we go through proof of concept of the building design, material technology was into the building, types of heating systems being used. Um, in Watford now we have 25 different types of build on site, five modular timber frame buildings, traditional precast concrete. Everyone has got different heating systems, different battery storage, combined heating systems, heat pumps, but it's different performance of the build and that's the idea behind innovation. And there's different partners in each of those projects as well. But the idea behind the innovation park is it's, it's scalable. So we have six innovation parks now around the world, in China, North America, Chile, and three in the UK. But each innovation park is unique to each country's building regulations and challenges. That's really key. And it's a network. So this isn't just a physical hub. We also connect with academia partners, manufacturers, regulators to actually build best practice and design and concepts. Um, and that's what we're planning for Ireland. So at the moment, we're currently in, in negotiations with semi-state bodies here to develop two innovation parks in Ireland and one of them is very closely linked to modern methods of construction. And this is why engagement and stakeholder involvement is really, really critical from the get-go on this. Um, so that's currently in, in, in discussion. I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards that wants to get a bit more information. Um, so, we, as I said, we've got four or five modular bills in the Innovation Park in Watford. Um, Deborah Smith from Tampa Housing is going to speak, and, and obviously we, we have a partnership with Tampa Housing, and they're currently a live project in Watford and Deborah will spend a bit more time on that. But I just want to go maybe through two examples in a UK and European context, what we've been doing in, in Watford. Um, so the first one is Project Utopia. I don't know if anybody's come across this. And um, this is a weather and fire resilient home. And like Ian said, that the, the purpose of this is to basically low cost, look at low cost compared to traditional build as well. It has a combined heating system, solar panels, but also smart connectivity is built into this building as well. Um, and also this, company is also developing this to the BPS standard. So it's one of the first modular companies actually to go through a kind of pilot scheme and a gap analysis to see where they are to the BPS standard. But what's really interesting about Utopia, they're not a construction or manufacturer, they're actually a digital company. The CEO is a chap of the name of Joseph Daniels, 27 years of old. And um, he wouldn't mind me saying he's a bit of a maverick. He speaks his mind, which is great in some ways because he actually tells you what he thinks. 
And so that's a digital company involved in this space as well. Um, from a European context, then we work a lot with User House in Switzerland. So if you go, if you've ever traveled continental Europe and you look at off-site, typically are three or four stories, volumetric construction, and a lot of them are value, uh, battery stories. User House have a house on the Innovation Park in Watford as well. Um, and again, that's volumetric. Um, if I then go from innovation and maybe give you two quick examples of what's actually happening in the UK at the moment. So at the moment, um, Home Group in the UK have developed an innovation village in, in Gateshead. And what's really interesting about this project, it's made up of 45 different types of build, but it's a mixture of modular and traditional build. So they're going through on site, and we're one of the partners in that in terms of the BPS standard is actually what works well, what doesn't work well. Duplex apartments, detached, semi detached, high rise. So that's currently a live project. I think at the moment they've got 10 or 11 of the builds built. It's 45 buildings in total that are planning to build. Um, but also how they help build a community and how they integrate with smart technology is really important in this as well. Um, and then if you look in, in practice in the UK, um, we've gone up a scale of production. So um, very recently, just at the beginning of February, um, Cambridgeshire Council approved the second stage development of a village called Inholm in, in Cambridgeshire. Um, and that's basically a village that's going to be consisting of 10,000 modular homes. Um, it's volumetric construction. And Ian mentioned Urban Splash are one of the key partners in that, along with Homes England. So again, demonstrating engagement and stakeholder involvement at the early stage go through proof of concept and what works well. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was fascinating and very good to see the examples that you gave of what's happening in the UK and the obviously great development in, in new housing. Um, so I'd like to introduce now Ger Fahey. Ger is the Managing Director of Horizon Offsite. And he's a civil engineer with 25 years experience in the offsite sector, moving into the fusion building business and subsequently other offsite manufacturers. And today, Jared is going to talk to us about the use of structural cold form steel systems in low and mid rise residential units and the potential for offsite construction. Thanks very much. Well, I th I think, um, and I think it's purely it comes out of natural. I think there's a silo mentality, people working in silos, and I don't think that's deliberate. It's just these people. I think um, if we could, because for example, I mentioned to you that there, there are bodies here looking at setting up as kind of a centre of excellence for modular construction and steering group, and there's two different bodies doing that. Um, to me, that demonstrates silo mentality, whereas they should be working together. You said joint up thinking in Ireland yeah. ever so small, yeah. and the government should think to play a role in that as well. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry, thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, good to be here. Um, my name is Ger Fahey. I, I, I work for a, a company called Horizon Offsite, and we're based in Care in County Tipperary. I'm trying to get everything put on. Let me get it going. Now. I just continue, so we'll be getting it going. We're Horizon Offsite, we're, we're a producer of coal form steel systems. So we, we, we produce, we design, we manufacture, and we install uh, a structure like the HDL system um, accredited uh, from our facility.
Do you want to talk now? Okay, it's a problem this time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Horizon was set up um, about three years ago, and, and we we set the business up because at the time we we, we I suppose we're we're all the, the guys involved in the business are all from like Cage Steel. We've spent years in in the game initially with with Fusion and other other systems. So I suppose we saw a niche in the market for for a, for a, I suppose a really good offsite system. And being involved in the system for a long, long time, we went and we set up the, the, the business. And I suppose we did it maybe a little bit different, where we did a lot of um, we did a lot of the accreditations first. So a lot of guys would go and, and 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 set up systems and start building. But we we went and we got the accreditations. We we did the fire testing, um, which is critical to our business. So it means that now we have a re we have a system that's that's fully accredited and and te fully tested. We're, we're always evolving. There's always more tests to be done, and we're, we're continuing to evolve our system. Um, once we get going, we'll... Yeah. Have you any videos attached to it? No. Yeah, there's another folder there, but there's nothing in that. Just either. didn't edit anyone. There's nothing in that. Okay. Would you say this? And then linking that to good finance and trying to put pressure on the financial service sector to say, well, look, here's best practice, properly rewarded. So, it's Well, it is, I mentioned, we all, we all know that unless it's properly assessed, and then it doesn't matter. For our sake and perspective, it's so important. It can high rise, which unfortunately we've been the other side of it as well. And this is one way we believe we can address those issues and concerns with government. And there's no reason why this couldn't be developed as a European yeah. That's the other side. So to kind of look at a broader base as well, yeah. it would be great for a car to be a driver. To be a driver, exactly. Yeah. That's the yeah. only thoughts on that. Well, I think it's really interesting. Um, you know Temporal so Health and the Fund mm -hmm. Europe stand for it. But they are working alongside um, the RE to, to make those standards uh, to comply with the UK regulations at the moment. And then the RE are heavily involved in we're working together to do that. So, and we're going through the bow test process as well at the moment. So that's really good. Yeah. And it's really important that we all meet the same standards and make sure that they're the best that we can do. Yeah. Yeah. What about yourself, Ian? You have just, you know, working on standards with this, what's involved yeah. in standards? Well, yeah, I, th I think um, that's a key thing because for us as architects, we have to the certify these houses yeah. in, in Ireland. And uh, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't have a certification yeah. standard, that we can sign off to, and um, we, we won't be recommending that system. So um, uh, I, I was aware of uh, BRE, BRE's work in the UK in terms of establishing that standard, and um, NSEI, we've been talking with them in terms of uh, how to go forward, but I think um, they're, in my own opinion, they're slightly behind BRE at the moment in terms of um, modular. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not open yeah. but it's it's it's, it's it's about embracing it. So you know, and, and because there's break. always a reluctance to put change. Yeah, just, just and, 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 and we need to find to do kind it. of rather find problems. So when I did come up, it was something on it. And John said, working together to find something. Oh, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it's really encouraging to say that, you know, to create a, a prototype in Ireland and create a kind of uh, uh, where you can go visit different 
modular solutions because it's not just one one uh, company which suits all. Like it's, it's you know uh, there's many uh, opportunities for many companies to get into space and really sort of innovate. No, it's not enough. There's no seven of them open there, and they're all 100. They only, it's nearly 100 max. Because that's what's happening, it's just it's large, but you now have seven of them open, so that's the problem. When it was entire points, entire points, points can't cope with it. Okay, so it's too much for the one day. Or well, just six apart, it's just too much. We're going to do that with Dublin yeah. so that we can actually have some figures and assessment on that. And assess yeah. proper assessment. Because at the moment, we can't really assess it because, you know, times are changing and prices are changing. And then we need to get to do a small project for us and let everybody see it. And just then we can scale it up from there. And so you're happy, was that going to happen this year? It's going to happen just going to save it as PDF. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we've obviously met a lot of different companies in the UK it's and in Ireland. Like eight and of them here. What we found out is that, much. you know, to get to kind of to have a, a facility like what I showed you on that uh, in the presentation, the video, video you know, can I put it on the map? It would use a year to employ all the staff and carry all the overheads. and. And it's and what what we found out when we just talked to various different companies is to get to really efficiencies and cost efficiencies, you really have to be going like five hundred minimum and then thousand, two thousand and ramping up a units and and I suppose in Ireland it's just trying to who, who do you sell that into? There's only a couple of companies that you can sell that into. So um one of the solutions that um, we were talking with some of the housing bodies is the housing bodies coming together and creating a framework behind them. Uh, where uh, very much of companies can come in with solutions yeah. and they can get a, a bulk of maybe 500 units you know, for a year so they can they can all uh, you know tender against each other and uh, bring competition into the marketplace but it has to be you know doing you know being efficient doing one or two like 10 houses or 14 houses over here it doesn't really suit a lot of those type of methods right but it, of course you can do it but it's just going to be with this very expensive I say it was well, we're, we're just doing it. We're not going to do it for profit. So, we're going to do it for the same So, that's going to involve uh, local housing bodies, um, main contracts. This is all going to join together. Where are you going to do that? I can't say that for sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> because it's going to happen later on. So, that's going to be really interesting. Yeah. Along with John, I think it's already. There's one other thing we are doing as well on a private basis with the standard publishing for them to develop modular training modules online. And give free access to people to look at as well. That's going to happen for the next two to three months. On modular construction. On, the, on modular construction, but also aligned to the standard. And what the yeah, process right. involved, the methodology as well, so people can get it from an education perspective and understand what's involved in this. Now, you take that off there. Yeah, what should I do? Maybe it's more for them. This is still a so big opportunity here for the corporate BIM and uh, we'll see, we'll we'll see what's on there. And this, this, can I put this in? About engaging the it's it's not, that's what's on it. It's not saving it. It almost seems like you know, you're developing your standards. Yeah. So that's my Can we close this one out? Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, but it has, it's on my PC, I think. Why, why won't it go to my PC? But that's it there, okay. Is it only that one? It's on as a as a per, but it's not. But uh, have you got it on the laptop? Have you got it on there? Because I just I just delete it off. That's not big enough for me to say it was a PDF file. So I just get it off. That's I've got a very large disk. Yeah, but it's just a one megabyte. Right. I'll take that out. Is we're going to put Deborah on next, yeah. and then we're getting this gentleman fixed, okay? And then we'll come back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I'll get straight into it and following on from what all the guys have said, it's really interesting and it's a continuation out from that. So I'm Deborah Smith and I'm from Tempo House in Ireland and that's uh, Quinton and he's the founder of Tempo Housing Global. So they're based in the Netherlands and they've been going for about 17 years as well and they're the country partners so most of these countries have already got um, projects up and running and they've been uh, involved in producing over 2,000 homes, hotels. So the key topics are MMC, case studies and collaboration and innovation. So you've probably heard all the different terminology around um, modular construction, volumetric, prefabricated. So the added value of modern methods of construction 50% faster so while the guys are on site doing the groundworks in the factory they're, um, they're being made. Less waste, the process of building through modular produces up to 90% less waste and they're complete 95%. So all our modules when they arrive you just basically plug them in, they're plug and play. And that cuts the schedule down by at least half because you don't need people coming in afterwards um, with different trades, etc. So I think somebody's already uh, gone through this through the years, and that's uh, Bristol again after the war. And I think they've done about 150,000 prefabricated homes. So that's what they used to look like then, and that's their latest uh, modular home now. And that's actually at the BRE Centre in Watford. And you can come along and jump on the floor if you like. <laughs> Which everybody does that anyway, as John says. Everyone comes in and starts jumping up and down to see. But uh, you won't go through the floor. It's all right. <laughs> so 
probably the same again, just like car manufacturing. And over time, it's just been, um, you know, getting better and better. And that's one of our factories we use. We actually use three different factories around Europe. So we've got different stakeholders in our projects. And um, we like to, everybody to get involved, architects, transport guys, uh, BIM, BRE. So that's the latest news uh, for 2020 and how modular construction is hitting the headlines. I started doing this about five years ago. When I was telling people about modular construction, I was just showing the door because uh, they had that preconception of old, cold prefabs like back in the you know post-war. But the industry is getting really big and I think it's really important for everybody to work together because there's plenty of business to be doing out there. So that's the industry as it stands now in America. It's worth, they reckon it's worth about 64 billion. And the latest percentage is 7.5 homes built each year, and that's in England now. So when I started, it was about two or three percent. So in the last five years, it's uh, really scaled up. And that's, that's even before you put in Vision Modular, who have already got up to 44 floors. So it's gone way past that now. So this is just a short video of the factory process, about one minute, 40 seconds. If I can, yeah. I think we'd be leaving out the swimming pool. Uh, um, okay, so the case studies. So this is a project we've done in uh, Utrecht, and this was for student accommodation, affordable housing, and that was the one that you see being built in the factory. So the outside of it doesn't look great, but the, they don't really care about the outside. They're more worried about what's on in the inside. So that was, we've done about, we craned in about 19 modules a day, and um, all self-contained apartments. That's what it looks like. So it's got its own bathroom, kitchen, etc. And this is our urban village. And this is 48 homes, all, all different configurations that comes in. And that's um, three stories, and there's a lift in each block. And this was um, designed by the government in Denmark for affordable housing. And it meets all the Danish regulations uh, currently for those standards. So as I said, we're working alongside uh, BRE to make sure that if they come into the UK and Ireland that they're going to meet those standards. But that's really high quality. So I think they had a bit of trouble with their main contractors, but um, they sorted it out. And um, it's just nearly finished now, ready for viewing, so we'll probably go over there and take some videos and post them online so you can actually see a lot what it looks like now after the soft landscaping. So that's it there. So the collaboration and innovation. We're working with lots of different partners at the moment um, all around Europe to find different kind of solutions. So along with the Irish Green Build Council and BRE housing associations, architects, developers. So really, I think for the modular industry, it's about everybody trying to work together because um, no one can just do that on their own. 
everybody's got different expertise, so it's easier for everyone to put their heads together than it is to try and do everything on your own. So a lot of our partners are in different parts of Europe, uh, Danish and um, American, New Zealand, and uh, in the UK as well, and Amsterdam. So our eco-friendly products, in nearly every one of our schemes, Tempo Housing always makes sure that they're providing the best eco-friendly homes that they possibly can. So we've done a lot of projects with green roofs that has a big impact on the environment. Solar panels, um, there's solar panels now that are built into roof tiles so you don't even have to put the roof tiles on and then the panels, you can actually get them where they're already done. Um, heat recovery systems, uh, we're trying we're building homes now to last instead of building them just to do for now and then retrofitting them later on. So we're going to be using a lot of heat recovery systems and renewables. Um, air source heat pumps that was put into Utrecht um, and the underfloor heating as well. And that was used on um, the, just the state electricity. So. so the advantages of light gauge steel that we use, um, the buildability, the speed, strong and lightweight. So you need them to be lightweight as well as well as being strong for the transportation and when you're loading them. And uh, some of the projects we put on top of um, supermarkets and other places, so it's important that we have the, the right weight. Um, so the fire safety, resistant and non-combustible, that's a, a big advantage for the light gauge steel as well. And it's easy to remodel. So if we've got to do different configurations, um, we can, we're able to do that and it gives us better design flexibility and the consistency of the material cost. Oh, right, that was quick. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much, and uh, I'd love to take some questions afterwards. Thank you. Hopefully it'll work this time. Okay, good to be back again. Okay, um, Joe Freddy is my name. Um, I work for a company called Horizon Offsite Limited. Um, we're we're a structural light gauge steel system based in Care and County Tipperary. I suppose we're relatively new. We we set up our business in May 2017. Um, the people within the business are in the business a long, long time. So we we probably we all originate from fusion. Back, back many, many, many years ago. Um, we've, got a, we've got a facility in care, which is about 3,000 square meters. Um, it's got X amount of office space. Um, it, initially, it was um, a, a timber frame facility. So it was ideal, really, for us, because we went, when we went into it, it was set up with gant, gant, gantry cranes and the like. And it's very, very convenient because it's literally off the motorway. So we're, we're an hour and a half from Dublin. We're very close to Limerick. We're very close to Cork. And obviously, we're very close to the ports getting stuff to the UK. There's four guys that set up the business. There's myself, the managing director. There's Tom and Martin Luddy. And, and there's Sean Dalton, who's our finance director. 
Um, that's just giving a spiel on, on, on us. It's just saying that we're, we're in the business a long, long time. John hasn't given me a picture yet, so when he does, I'll stick it up there. Um, but we, we, we bring probably varying um, disciplines to our business, where I've been involved in design, marketing, uh, commercial management. The guys have been involved in site. Mark has been in, involved in site a long, long time. And Tom has been involved in operations. So really, we, we, we bring all the traits that we need uh, for our business. Um, OK, what is off-site? Excuse me now if we're, we're going to repeat it a little bit, because it's the game. People's perception of off-site sometimes is cabins, temporary accommodation. And that has a place in the market, but that's not the off-site that we're involved in. So basically, the off-site that Horizon is involved in is structural certified light gauge steel systems um, that, that can be, you can do whatever you want. There's also modular in the business. People spoke about vision. I worked for John Fleming for, for, for 10 years. John is really leading the way in, in, in modular construction in the UK. So our gig is, is, is structural offsite systems. So types of offsite. There's, there's, there's lots of offsite systems in the market. There's panelized units, which are produced in a factory environment and assembled on site. That's us, creating structures on site. There's volumetric construction, which is basically full volumetric produced in a factory and sent to site. There's different types of hybrids. There's floor, there's roof cassettes, there's precast, there's ICF. So there's quite a lot of systems on the market. And us in, in Horizon, we're promoters of off-site, so we promote off-site systems. So we're, 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 we're always promoting off-site because there is a big market both here in the UK and there's plenty of room for everyone in it. Um, some of the systems, timber, light gauge steel, precast concrete, lightweight modular structures, the hot roll steel modular systems with concrete slab, which is division modular, and some ICF foundation systems. So there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff on the market at the moment. Um, so what is light gauge steel? So light gauge steel really is, it's, it's a rapid method of constructing structures ranging in height from single story units to multi-story buildings. At the moment in, in the UK where we, we've got SCI accreditation to 10 stories, in Ireland we're accredited to six stories, but we're just waiting on our NSAI cert for 10 stories. Um, the structures are formed from cold steel sections assembled into panels. The panels are ship, shipped to site for assembly to form buildings. And light gauge steel is, is, is one of the methods referred to as MMC. OK, what does Horizon do? So we have two systems really on the market. We have a, we have a structural system. So it's a fully structural system that we, full, we, we fully design everything. We manufacture it, and we ship it to site, and we install it on site, and we sign it off. So it's that, we call that our structural system. That's the majority of work we do. Up to 10 stories in the UK and six in Ireland at the moment, and will be 10 very, very soon. We've got an infill system. So we have a preformed insulated panel that really infills between concrete buildings, hot roll steel buildings. We can do various finishes on that. So we can put boards on it. We can take it to, to certain levels, depending on what the client wants. So this is basically what we do. We fully design everything. We procure the steel. We put it into our, we put the steel through our roll formers. The steel components are produced. We assemble them into different um, panels, internal, external, non-load bearing, load bearing. We assemble floors. We put it on a truck. We ship it to site. We offload it on site and we install it. So it's a full system from design to install on site. I suppose this, does our design, I, Offsite is all about design, and, and you'll, you'll see at the end of this some of the challenges we have at the moment are design. Everything is, it's, it's, design is critical to an offsite process and to offsite working. So we've got, we've got in-house chartered engineers. We work under our own PI. Um, we've got our own drafts people. We use three-dimensional technology to frame our systems, which, which can be imported into Rivet and BIM. Um, 
a lot of guys use that in the UK at the moment. There's some people using it in Ireland. So all our design is done in-house. We take the architect's design, because we're not the designers of the building, but we're the designers of our system. So we take the architect's design and we create three-dimensional um, structural models based on that design, designed by us. You'll see on the bottom there, there's two pictures. There's one as a frame model, and that's the building that's been, been constructed on site. Everything to do with off-site and to do with any type of build needs to be built to specification and to performance. We're no different. Um, we get a specification at the start of a building. We have to, we have to comply with that in terms of U-values, in terms of air, 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 air exchanges, in terms of sound, and in terms of fire, and in terms of structure. No different. So, so again, the perception that off-site is, is, is temporary, it's, it's, it, it's out the window, because we have to deal with the same as anyone else. Um, and we do. The benefits of off-site. We've gone through them here today. But just to go through them again, the speed of build. We can build things quicker on site. Reduce prelims. If you get off site quicker, you're going to reduce your site costs. It's, it's, it's simple. Structural. With our system, it's steel. So, in terms of settlement issues, in terms of dimensional accuracy, fast drying out floor spans, again, we've, we've gone through them on lightweight structures, fire rating, it's steel. We've done all the accredited fire tests. We're still doing tests. We're going to keep doing them because the, the, the market keeps evolving all the time in terms of non-combustibility. So we're, we're, going to, we're, we're, we're constantly doing R&D in our product. Um, durability, it's long-lasting. Health and safety, from, from our system, we, we, have, we have an excellent record in health and safety, which is, which is paramount to our business because everything we do is very light, is very dry. We go on site with... Um, with um, four guys or five guys and we erect houses. So we don't have a lot of labor. So we, we, we're at uh, no accident since we started. So we, we've, whatever, I, I, I should have put the stats up there. So sustainability, big, big, big thing right now, which is the right way to be. So we can achieve whatever rating you want. Um, a high percentage of steel is, is, is recycled. Reduce foundations, reduce concrete, less disturbance and noise on site, structural efficiencies. And so again, it's 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 ticking all the boxes right now for sustainability. There's just a picture on the bottom there showing you different types of of offsite where you have one D, two D, and three D. So the two D is what we do. So it's we we'll, we we'll, on average we'll get two units on a on a truck going to site. We spoke about them, um, and, and, and it's good that some of the actual figures here match up with the guys before me, also, which is good. Um, the growth opportunities within our market at the moment, or the issues within our market, is the, the skill labour, is the lack of it, uh, the potential safety rate, the, the, the unrealistic pressure to complete projects uh, and programmes. It, it, they're, they're getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Quality issues, snags, financial variations, again, factory control product easier to deal with. Fire issues and detailing, which is ongoing all the time in terms of fire stopping, cavity closing, fire rating your walls, inside out, outside in. Again, factory control products can deal with it. The market, there's 250,000 or more houses to be built in the UK per annum. There's 30 or 35,000 houses to be built in Ireland per annum. So again, as the guy said before, the, the offside is the solution, right? But it's not the only solution. It's a part of solving this problem. Um, the above figures do not include schools, care homes, hotels, apartments, etc. So there's lots and lots of stuff to be built right now. Um, our traction to date, right, we, we, are, we, we, we came from the industry. So when we set up our business, within two months we were building stuff, mainly in the UK. We, we targeted the UK from the off. So we were building a lot of stuff in the UK. But as the company has evolved, we're probably building more in Ireland right now. Um, because we've come from the industry, we've really employed some of the, the top people because, experience because they've been in the industry and we know them. So we've brought in designers with experience. We've brought in project managers with experience and they're building teams underneath them. Um, we've achieved NSCI, 
um, to 18 metres at the moment, and our revised cellar is going to 30 metres. We have we have CE Marken, we have SCI, we've 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 tested our walls, internal, external floors, fully loaded and fully serviced. We've saved T certs, so we've put a lot of work into our accreditations, and that's not going to stop. We're going to keep um, getting accreditations, testing our product. Um, the guys in County Tipperary, even though I'm a Limerick man, we got lots and lots of um, um, awards at the start, um, which was great because it, it really gave us um, a good stance. I'm just going to show you some projects. So these are some case studies that, that, that we would have done and started up. In the UK, we build a lot of rooftop developments because we're light. So the project on, 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 on the left is a two-story roof. It makes it easier for the guys going onto existing buildings. Again, we can put certain finishes onto it. So we boarded that one and the client came on site and insulated it. So we, we really can take it to wherever the client wants. The project on the right is a job that we, we have completed in Ramsgate in the UK. It's, it's X amount of apartments and some social housing. Um, again, went, went, went very well. This was, um, this was a project we did about a year and a half ago, which was really a tester project for us. And I suppose it's something that we're, we're always looking at. We're always looking at the, the, the satellite factory and setting up the satellite factory because offsite is all about the design hope, but where you produce product, it really doesn't make a difference. So this was a project we did in Malta. We, we, met, we designed everything in care. We, we rolled the 2D components. We shipped everything to Malta and we erected it on site and it worked very well. So it was a tester for us at the time. It was, it was for, on, from a satellite factory and also from a Brexit point of view. We were seeing would this work, and it did. We could be out in Malta building hotels now if we wanted to, but right now it, probably, it doesn't really suit us to be out there building. Um, just different projects that we have done. Apartments in the UK, rooftop developments, some social housing in, in Tipperary, um, more apartments in the UK. So again... What this is showing you is we, in offsite, we love boxes, but unfortunately we don't get many of them anymore. So from a frame solution, we, we can cater for um, what, what the design throws at us. Another social project in Bolton Glass. Um, again, we can do very, this one is with steel trusses. We've, we we pre-board gables, we fire rate gables. We put different things onto the house subject to what the client wants. So again, we can take it to varying finishes. I suppose the big issue with this project specifically was we were we this was an external masonry finish. We had something like um, uh, 35 or 36 houses erected, and the blocks weren't started on the first one. So it's just showing you the lack of the the the, the lack of skilled labour in the country because it. Really, to utilize an offsite system, you need to be behind it. So you need to be putting your windows in. You need to be getting the mas You need to be closing it up. If you if 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 you're not you're not putting blocks on it for three months, do you know what? It it it, it defeats the purpose. Some private housing in Cork, um, and this was this was a, a real interesting one for me because when I worked with John Fleming and Fusion, a long long time ago, we built. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of houses in in Cove in Cork, and this is literally one of the this was the the add-on to it, which was which was designed for John Fleming, but was built by another contractor. So the whole site here was built in LGS. So we we went and we just kicked off and started building the rest of it again. So it went very well for the for the contractor. Again, some rooftop developments in in Watford, a tricky project um, off the, off the main street or the high street in Watford. So again, the, the really the only way of building this was an offsite solution. This one we did, we, we put boards, we, we, we put some brick slip on it, we did some different things to this because the whole thing here was do as much offsite as possible. Um, some um, apartments in, um, in, in Ipswich, in Felixstowe and Ipswich, again, you saw the, the three-dimensional model of it prior to that. So again, seeing all the, 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 the various designs, the hotel down the road, so we built um, an extension to Lawler's, which was um, uh, 60 plus beds 
onto the back of it, it's, it's, probably, it's probably bigger than the, the existing hotel. Incorporating concrete floors, again incorporating some boards. So, again, utilizing design. Okay, we, I'll run through this quickly. We've all gone through it where every magazine at the moment is telling us that we need X amount of houses and we haven't the capacity to build them. So, so off-site really has to be utilized. To, to be part of the solution to solve this. We, we need a half a million houses by the year 2031. So that's, that's what the stats are telling us. And that's, that's going up. So we, we have to grab offsite to, solve, to, to, to partly solve that, that, that problem. Again, in the UK, it's the same. We, there, there is a demand for, for, for units. And they're not being they're not being built. Again, it's it's just the, saying the same thing. Um, I suppose the difference maybe maybe it's not a difference, but I suppose in the UK there is a drive for offsite, and and there is a push to 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 utilise offsite. Maybe not not so much at the moment in in, in Ireland. Um, I'm just going to show you so, some key 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 applications of offsite i suppose some of these that I, they were with my fusion days some of them are not so it, it gives you an idea of what can be built two-story housing um this is a job in 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 Kinsale that was done in light gauge steel um contemporary um developments in the uk again different finishes balconies projections it it can be done um, Adamstown in, in, in Dublin, we, um, we, we went on to Adamstown about 10, 10 or 8 years or whatever it was and there was 10,000 units to be built on site. So it was, it was, we were saying park the sales for a couple of years were, were great but obviously there was issues after that. So we built about, um, I think we built about 900 units maybe or there or thereabouts before the industry um, imploded. But again different forms. We did lots of, we built two-story, three-story apartments. Um, starter homes, again, different finishes. At the moment, we're exploring, um, we're exploring um, finished panels. We're exploring putting different finishes onto panels. Um, so it's, it's, it's possible. This, this, was, uh, this was John Fleming's hotel in Photo in Cork, built out of light gauge steel. Um, with concrete floors, so off a podium slab. So again, it's a faceted building, it's a core building, but it was built out of light gauge steel. Care homes, um, did lots of them in the UK. We're looking at lots of them in Ireland. Dad and student accommodation seems to be the big, the, 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 the big driver at the moment. And hotels, you saw the hotel down the road. It's, it's a no-brainer to build hotels and offices because it's quick and it, it's all about getting heads on the beds. And our infill system. Um, depending on the height of the building, putting panels in, different varies of finishes, boarded, insul not just panel itself, panel with a board, panel with an insulation and a board, um, VPMs, different, different, we, we can really do what the client wants. I suppose challenges, right? You see design, 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 right? That's, I suppose, our biggest challenge right now in, 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 in offsite. And it's not that design is difficult, it's getting the time in design. Because there is, there is a culture that, it, that, that the procurement is last minute.com all the time. And, and, and we struggle with that. Because offsite is all about design. It's all about having the correct time at the design phase to build it on your computer, make the mistakes on your computer, and send it to a factory. If you if that's squeeze, it you ha, you it become you you have issues. And normally, in Ireland, that is squeeze. People see the end date, the, fin the the start date keeps moving, so the design bit is is squeeze. Early involvement, which is is design, it's procurement. People people they they, they won't commit until the last minute. Commercial terms, because we're off-site, there's, there's deposits, there's, and it's that culture, it's the culture in Ireland where why should I give you money because you've done nothing? 
and it's it, that's the culture. So we have to, we have to, we encounter that all the time, and we have to we have to try to solve that all the time because we're an offsite, so we produce everything in a factory prior to going to site. So we're not doing nothing; it's actually produced, but it's sitting in the factory. And the understanding of offsite, we put some slides up at the start where people's perception and understanding of offsite, and I get it all the time, the same as everyone, where guys come in and jump on the floors and shoulder the walls just to see that will it actually stand up, right? It does. <laughs> we just I'll give you one example. We we did it. We um, we did a job in the UK back a while back, and we brought some guys in from um, from 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 abroad, and uh, and and they literally gave um, 25 minutes jumping around the floor and shouldering walls. Couldn't budge it, but that was the perception. But it, so it's, it's understanding and perception. And I think they're really our, our challenges right now. They're the challenges that we encounter on a daily basis. But as an off-site manufacturer, they're the challenges that we need to solve. And I think if we can solve them, and, and, and I, I think off-site then has, has a real, real part to play in solving some of the issues in terms of housing. Yeah. That's it, and it, it worked. So. Um, okay, so we've had some questions already and we've had our four speakers finish now. I think it's been very interesting to hear the different perspectives and the different challenges each of the speakers have coming from their own particular organisations. But I do see kind of common themes coming across as well in terms of the new technologies being used, the importance of planning and design, the use of digital technologies and the collaboration piece as to how we can work together to make this all happen in the future. Are there any particular questions now that people would have? Alan? Yes, one for Chair. Um, you mentioned just at the start briefly about labour, the time of labour. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Uh, I suppose because we, we produce stuff in the factory, the guys that we have on site are minimum. So a typical crew for, for us would be four guys in a single place. So, and that same four guys would put in the region of three to four houses of a week of frames. Obviously, the house has got to be finished. So, so that's the result. We, we, we don't need lots of guys on site. If we're we're going to the factory to the fields. Yes, and all, all the time, depending on. So, the, I suppose the whole thing with the manufacturing business, we, 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 we're a bit of a hype. We, we deal with we're precise manufacturing, but we deal with site. The site change is constant. So we have a planned manufacturing facility dealing with sites. So sometimes, because of issues in terms of, we, we, we might be able to get the guys we want. So we have trained guys in our factory facility that will go to the site and install the product. It's not their job. Their, their main job is to, to manufacture the product. But sometimes we utilize that depending on, depending on, on, on how busy we are. One final question at the end. So you're just building the steel frame itself. You're not building the Correct. We, we, what we do is we build the, the steel frame, but we do certain things to it. So if you think of a, a two-story house, we build the structure of the two-story house, so which is the steel frame. We insulate it. We put specific grounds on the panel to take your external facade. We can do certain fire stopping. We can do cavity closing. We can put roofs on it. So it really depends. What we don't do is we don't do the finishes. So I need the M and E within a building. The external facade, the brickwork, is done by it's done by someone else, and you're boarding within the building. Yeah, like we would have been involved in a project many years back in Hundred Fusion, isn't it? That's it. In Water Castle, we were getting forty-eight or fifty-eight houses. Now it's twelve years ago when we did that project. Now it's a very successful project, and the houses are holding out very yeah. well, and it's, it was great. It was, it was a, that was a logistically challenging one because yeah. it wasn't an island.
and I yeah. Yeah. So we had to physically get the frames on, on, on the little ferry that went to the island. Exactly. So it was so good. It, again, it is the, the right thing, the, the, the right product and that was, was offside because you, you were getting two units on a, on a truck to go to site that had to be ferried over as opposed to some other trucks for tradition. So it worked. Excellent, thank you. You had a question? Yeah, John. John, I have a question for Deborah and for Jerry. I'm looking at the, the and, and the others if they want to jump in. I'm looking at the space that's been used to do the prefabrication. In some ways, it looks like an assembly shop. And I'm, I'm interested in knowing what is the degree that it's a tag hand connection to fucking reform or actually produce products that is actually a I would describe manufacturing tolerance as opposed to construction tolerance. Mm. And is it economical to push that far? Mm. The question is economical to push that far and um, there's quite large teams in the factory that do all that precision engineering to make that the viable production. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, I suppose, everything that we do is driven by design, but it's also driven by CNC coding. So if, if we see guys in our factory floor and, and cutting steel, we, we have a problem because the machines produ produce everything from the design file. Right? Sometimes it happens, we have to be real, but everything is produced from a design file and a code is sent, a CNC code is sent to the machine. So the machine will punch the holes, it will punch the service holes, it will create the lengths of the studs, and it's after to kind of zero one of the millimeter. So if the, if the, if the the frames are not fitting together. It's not the machine. It's the design that was done on it. So it's, it's a very, very precise um, production facility, and we, we, we don't see guys up there um, with with any of We do. We have a problem. Um, and just as a follow-up, what about the actual base on which this is being erected? What quality control have you to do on that to ensure that your product? It's a challenge all, all the time, um, because again, as I said before, you're dealing with a very, very precise product and you're dealing with size. So, so the, the tolerances on the base are critical to us, and, and we look for plus or minus five mil on the base. Do we always get it? No. Do we, we, can, we, we can overcome some, some tolerance differences, but we don't want to be doing that, because if we, we're starting to do that, then you're getting cold bridges, you're getting air type issues. But again, it, that's really down to the, we, we, we want to drive the quality through to the main contract, and that's why we like, we like, we like working with the same main contract. So well, we, we try to get a, get a main contractor on board, and you know what, between both of us, then we work together to get that quality from our factory, our manufacturing facility, right to site. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And that, that's, that's the nature of where we are. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, yourself. One of the observations on, on modular is that in terms of the design process, the kind of the, the specialist uh, design from the modular suppliers comes in at the very end of the process. And it, it seems from the you know from the aesthetic and from the projects that are being delivered um, that there's opportunities are lost there. Whereas if you were designing or master planning a project knowing that it was going to be modular. Perhaps it would have a very different aesthetic that would be very streamlined, very robust, very simple, very very clean. And and it just seems that the the industry, you know, when you look at the examples of projects, they're, they're probably not the ideal design for modular. And, and I'd be interested just to hear the views on on what the you know what the perfect typology is for. That's a really good question. Um, we get um, drawings out all the time by our perfectionists and how oh, will that work in modular? And it doesn't always work. So we have to they have to be redrawn again. So for us we like to start right from the, no. the red line drawing and get the architects on board at the early stage. So that way we know we design it specifically to modular and we don't try and take it from tradition and then make it modular because 
that's when you want to see this. But it's, but it's also, it's a culture change. Yeah. It's, it's at the moment, it, 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 it's to hit the nail on the head, really. We're, we're trying to make traditional designs work in logic. The, 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 the holy grail for, for, for me as an outside manufacturer is to have every involvement. We never get it, we very rarely get it because the client will not commit at that stage. So what happens is the design team will design the building, possibly as traditional or whatever, and then from, from a possibly a value engineering point of view, the, the client will go and look for an alternative. We, we, we always want to be involved early because we can value engineer what, so so that's that's exactly where we need to go. It doesn't it's not happening in Ireland. We we get involved with the we get a we get a design. So even at the very start, when we get stuff priced, we get a traditional design in and we price it on that. And we make it work, as opposed to the total opposite of it. Is, which is the which is the right way. In the UK now, um, the government there is giving out like site planting and stuff like that, helping them designs and sites. So that's what we do, we do early engagements because otherwise it's not cost effective to try and switch it up at the mm -hmm. end. And plus um, we're trying to encourage our architects now to maybe do two sets of drawings, mm -hmm. where they are traditional and modular, and then we don't have that problem by trying to switch over later on because it's uh, nearly impossible to try and find it. But Ian, can you comment on that? It having to do two sets of drawings? Yeah, no, I suppose so I'm an architect and uh, I, I, I relate to that, but we do lots of houses seen across the country and uh, we're, we're now uh, looking at obviously designing to, some of these houses seem to a modular uh, methods of construction in terms of the, the widths of the blocks that they need to be done, but you have to do for, like, you, you can't design a housing scheme and then go, okay, we're going to do the modular, it just doesn't work. We've done it, we've, we've priced up schemes in uh, Wexford uh, Tipperary and so on, um, with other companies who do modular systems in, in Ireland, and uh, it, it just wasn't more, it, it wasn't uh, cost effective. Like uh, traditional was, was still more cost effective, but that's because um, it wasn't designed for a modular system. Construction. Are you, are you okay, Tipperary? <laughs> so, uh, so what we're doing is uh, there's a, a few houses we're working at the moment and we're, we're, we're designing specifically for, for modular uh, methods and, and, and that's the only way to do it really. Like, and it's, it's, it's getting that out to, uh, uh, there's a lot of times when you take on a client, clients, so a lot of clients uh, are maybe thinking of flipping the site, moving the site on, so they're just looking at how many units can they get in there mm -hmm. and make sure, to get, keep, keep the planners happy, get them through the system, you know, uh, they're not necessarily thinking about like, okay, Build this. Then you've got other clients who are a bit more um, thinking about how, how I'm going to deliver this, how I'm going to sell the best value, and so on. And there you have the clients that we would sit down at early and, and, and discuss from the trade off and saying, Do you want to go full of uh, bottometric or uh, part uh, market construction of this, or do you want to go traditional? And, and when we get to QS, it's kind of price it out um, at that stage. And that's where the case of innovation comes from. That's, that's where the traditional at the modern home group are driving it. They bring in key partners in place with a number of design teams from different organizations involved. Forms they are also involved with that as well because they want to use that as proof of concept and say, right, what works well, and then go live commercially to market and start to develop that. So. John had a question there. Uh, uh, just so that I'm clear about this, what, what I'm actually hearing here is that um, modular can actually match traditional if it's actually. It's like if the project is designed to be modular, but that it, is, it goes the other way. In other words, if it has been designed traditionally and it's just given out to people who do modular, they, it probably won't work. Is that, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, well, it, it, like, you know, I said, when we're talking about modular, like, there's lots of different systems like, that you can use. You know? So some are more flexible than others. You know? Like Horizon would be a more flexible system than obviously you're going to a volumetric system here because uh, uh, this company that we're kind of working with in the UK that I showed you there, um, I was, uh, I pronounced their name, like Ilgi, uh, Homes, they're, they're called, and they, they have basically their module that 
you buy it if it has a floor plan. Like, uh, so, you know, if, if we're going to them, you're picking up a catalogue of what houses you want to put into the development. Um, and there may be some kind of tolerances within design, but it's fairly, fairly fixed. But they, 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 they're going in that route because um, they can get efficiencies and you're buying off their kind of um, uh, tested designs. So, um, it, in the cases that we've seen it is that, yeah, it, it sometimes, you, you know, you can't mix and match that easily, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and only like in where I think in Dublin where the price of construction and is higher, and um, you know it can, can balance out a bit. But once you go outside Dublin, you know what we see at the moment is you know, traditional methods are still kind of slightly cheaper, or are certainly on par right wing with the modern methods. Yeah. And I suppose from, from our point of view, you, you're, you're you're right in, in, in one sense. We when, when our horizon system really comes into its own from about two stories to about eight, and that's 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 our niche market. Sometimes below two stories, um, sometimes we will struggle a little bit to compete. But I suppose the the, the issue we have probably in terms of from a, from a cost point of view is is getting the whole system assessed. So assessing the overall product as opposed to just a like for like square meter rate. So assessing the program savings, assessing the obviously the, the for the money that needs to be repaid. So a full assessment of the cost. But being very honest, sometimes in two-story units, um, depending if, if, if the client wants to build a lot of units very quickly, we're very, very competitive. But if the client wants to build a unit a week, he's going to use tradition. And again, but where we really excel is two-story, three-story, four-story, five-story. Um, Dublin sites, wherever apartments, getting in, getting out, their apartments, their commercial that people want to build as quick as possible, to the highest quality possible, and off the site. I think a part of answer to your question as well, if you look at what the big compressors have done to these spaces in the land, they're not investing it themselves in turn, they're actually acquiring sort of system that's even more efficient built. At the time that they can stay in every child because of the efficacy of the expertise is delivered. And it'd be great to have the amount of Keep repeating myself, but early engagement, stakeholder involved. It would be great to get the big contractors that are actually they're investing in these companies as well and bringing everybody together mm. and kind of put pressure and strategy into policy here and build it into the housing strategy here directly. But part of it should be in the market also as, as a solution. And again, it is, it is only part of the solution. We all agree it's not going to be the big solutions. Question here. Uh, Lionel Ropes are really involved in this in the UK, aren't they? It'd be great if, if they could, um, could do some modular housing or building here. But the question I want to ask you is about energy rating of the modular. Like, do you have, can you build a house to NZ rights with? Yeah. I suppose, it, it, again, it's, we can build it to the specification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it, and, and, and it, 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 we keep harping on that, that all comes back to early involvement. Yeah. So, <clears throat> specific new values, we can achieve them. Specific air types, ratings, we can achieve them. Specific Y values, Psi values, all achievable. The whole system is modeled. But again, that's all about the design phase. Yeah. So if we know at design phase that this is the way it needs to go, the house is designed to that. So it's, it's early involved. And it's and early involved might mean you might save money on certain things where we're very good at junction detail. You might need such a good window. You might need a, a, a new value on your wall. You might get away with it. So it's again, it's it's early involvement, which which could value engineer your building, but we can really we build to specification. So whatever the spec is, we build to. Excellent. There's more question there at the back, yeah. Just a question. Because of John there, and you mentioned say the, um, uh, you know, working with both us and being complementary, and um, could we be in, in discussions with say the agronomic certification process with the NCI? Um, just before we answer that, is there anybody here from the NSCI? Yeah. Secondly, we have tried engagement. <laughs> and that's all I can say. And we have tried, and um, but um, it's not the second thing. Challenges. Okay, you tell the question. Yeah, the question, yeah. Yeah. 
see some of the horizon line to the systems that we use are of the clients of the three-dimensional training systems that can be imported to a BIM model, uh, which, is, which, is, which is critical. That doesn't happen a lot in Ireland. Um, it, it's starting to, but uh, in Ireland at the moment, a lot of the, a lot of the design is 2D. It's not three-dimensional. But we have the systems that we can, we, you can import the model, you can crash detect, you can punch holes in certain elements or services. So again, it's all about getting that design going at an early stage to make sure that if you've got a service running through your floor, that there, there's, a, there's a punch out in a, in a, in a, in a choice. Or if you've got services running through your frames, that you're, you just punch yourself up, that you're not, you're not drilling holes inside. Because it's defeating the purpose with offside if you're having to drill stuff and cut stuff on site. Should, you should never be doing that. You should, the, the, you should have no waste. Really, everything is done on your, on your computer. So again, we, we would love guys to be asking us for our three-dimensional model. Some guys do, some guys don't. Um, I might add in the context of what we're doing in the UK and UK governments around digital transformation of structure. So there's a whole project going on at the moment called Construction Innovation Hub in the UK. So part of digital transformation of structure, but it goes beyond construction because it's a society and manufacturers. So us as a test interpretation of what we're doing, one of the biggest challenges in the construction sector is um, some data can be too complex, too complicated. So you take a door or a window, you apply different software models to it, it's different. So it's trying to simplify that data in building projects. It's a challenge. So one of the things we're doing is very early stage, and it's, it's on our website, we're developing called Build Data Book, which will link, link into the supply chain construction blockchain. And that Build Data Book will actually simplify that data. So when you're using that or CAD, you can actually use an API to put in software into that Build Data Book, to simplify the data from the installation plan and the floor of the window. So when you're looking at the education, you can actually see what I think if you look at it, if you look at Ireland and again we're going to hear from the CIS, um, I'm not here speaking for CIS, but the daily example of the contract that we do with the contract is using the bin, a perfect example of the central parks and contract. And they, they made very good about this. They when they when they went to tender for that, um, it was the first time that they, they actually used the model in the central parks across the UK and Ireland. But not only was it delivered on time, it was delivered on budget. So I think Central Parks are going to actually review how to make a tender and make an engaging model and get a model as part of different projects. It's a great example of them working in collaboration. Yeah, and I suppose in, in, in our particular business, obviously, um, uh, being using Wibbit, it's, it's just upskilling, um, I suppose, the, the older kind of um, staff in our office into it. Because what we find is a lot of younger people are coming through all know how to use all the software, but they don't necessarily have the knowledge. And so it's, it's incubating kind of the, the experienced, uh, kind of seasoned kind of uh, architects in our office with the, with the younger um, uh, kind of architects coming through and making that work. But I think over time, you know, it, it, just, it, just, it is becoming just, you know, uh, standard and, and uh, people are just buying into it because it is, that's the way the industry is going and everybody's buying into it. So, uh, we would have started this back probably, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, we got the first kind of uh, license uh, in our office. But it took it took a long time for it to be really kind of taken on board with our staff. Uh, but it's, it's, it is like most things that we do would be done uh, through Rivet. They really listen to quite a lot, and they're, they're part of the, you know, Relation Hub now in the UK. So um, our project kicks off in April. Working alongside the uh, PRE and uh, all, our, all our projects will be done after this meeting. The, the um, issue of skills is very important in this area as with any changes in any industry sector and obviously the use of technology and digitalization is a huge one. I'm interested in your views on what other skills are, are perhaps going to be needed in the future for people working in this field. Um, obviously the tools like technology are very important but are there going to be different skills that are needed that are particularly relevant to modular construction like perhaps project management or a different kind of way of collaborating um, in terms of virtual design or has anything come up in any of your organizations that you think yeah if only we had somebody who was skilled in x to 
help us with this. Is there anything? The project London is important because yes. going from the factory to the site, yeah. and getting, you might be using different main contractors, you might not use the same main contractors depending on where your project is. So mm. having that project manager that can liaise with the the factory and the other teams as well. Would be important. And I suppose even in terms of transport and logistics, transport that's going to be key. Yeah. You will have that. Project managers in our business are very, very important because if, if, like traditionally on site, you, you, you would have a project manager on site, but really the guys we have are all encompassing. They, they really manage the project from, from end over to finish on site. Even though they're not design managers, they, but they will manage the design process. They're not, they're, not, they're not our operations guy, but they have to make sure that, that it's built to the plan. Yeah. So really they have, yeah. they have, they have they're, they're, they're involved a lot more than they would be traditionally. Also, our, our design guys are critical to us. Hmm. The, 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 the right um, drafts people, and I suppose you, we're, we're lucky because I suppose we, we, when I work at Fusion, we have lots and lots of guys, and everyone everyone at Fusion had a really, really good experience, so it's easy enough to get these guys back into our business. <coughs> so they're bringing a lot of experience. So really, our critical guys are our design team, and our project managers that, that would take the project from initial stage right to the end. Excellent. Yeah, so I suppose a lot of in, in the module, you're solving a lot of issues out in the office rather than on site, right. than on the traditional thing. So, mm -hmm. so there's a lot more, it's a more intense uh, process in the beginning. You know what I mean? Right, John, yeah. the planning is critical because obviously you've got a good manufacturing facility, that's how to keep going. Mm -hmm. If that ain't going, you, you, you have an issue, so your, yeah. work, so your project manager yeah. planning the job. And planning the slots. It's critical. What about yourself, John? From a different angle, yeah. the test and certification point. So, um, one of the things you mentioned is health and well being and safety mm -hmm. in the work environment, the living environment, and the serious lack of um, health engineers and fire engineering courses across the UK and Ireland. You know, the guys who have a Kenny IT at Queen's University, or so Georgetown and Waterford, but the lack of fire engineers, how they actually track down to the that area is key. Um, I think from a legislative perspective, there's also a huge challenge here for local authorities in interpretation of legislation. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, I mean, a traditional house story building or a module building in Cork may be signed off by a fire officer, and it's the same building regulations. That same building may or may not be signed off by another local authority. <laughs> and it comes down to interpretation, and we have come across on numerous occasions where um, the developer could show there's a simplification to the fire test report that they made. So consistency, consistency interpretation legislation, um, because each local authority has different views on the legislation. So to me the challenge would be is well, for example, if you, from a fire safety perspective, why would not be an overarching national fire authority to provide this from the very top down to keep on top of the moment? And I don't know whether that falls within the National Building Control Office or where that could into that. So uh, you've been talking about um, skills needed in project management, in design, in health and safety, in collaboration, in um, co the computer digitalization. It seems to me that um, half of the population could be trained up into that. The half of the population that currently is not traditionally involved in the construction sector. So I would put it out to everybody that there are key skills there that are needed that women perhaps don't know about and let them know that this is a great industry to be in and they can be involved in the future of the built environment. So I put that challenge out to everybody here today. And it, it sounds like from where you're coming from, you welcome more people coming in. You welcome women, you welcome men, but particularly women because they're not traditionally there at the moment. So. Uh, I think that just goes back to secondary schools. Yeah, it goes back yeah. to primary nearly. Yeah, my, my, my daughter is doing architecture technology in the boys' school because they're building up the models. Yeah, in the yeah. girls' school. Girls school. Yeah. So if you want to encourage the small women or whatever in society to come along with this, let's go back to secondary school. Yeah, yeah. and Engineers right. Ireland are doing a lot of work here with that right. and, and our AI. Um, time for just one more question, perhaps anybody has another question? Oh, we have two. I guess you go back to you here. And on the, you talked about the manufacturing process and the off-site off model would be the manufacturing process. So what is being learned from manufacturing? Everything is created.
years ago. So, so we, we are seeing our, we are in a ZIFL. So really, it, it, what it does is it makes, it, it makes your business a very lean business. Because you, you can't have a factory that, that everything is thrown that just doesn't work because you're assessed regularly. So what it does is it, 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 it makes the business lean, which, which, which betters the margins. And, 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 that, and that's exactly where we see it going. It also drives quality. So quality with a factory, it, it's not, it, quality within a factory, you don't automatically get it. You've got to, you've got to have the right people and you've got to drive it down really from the top. But when you do, it works. And you're getting quality products. So it's really for us, it's, it's making our business very lean and it's making the product that we supply very high quality. That's what manufacturing does for us. Thank you. And a final question at back. So, in my experience, um, the fire testing is required for offsite and you're clever and clear, but um, very well aware of the, um, the testing standards that exist at the moment. Um, any tests that are done for offsite um, are, you know, the tests don't replicate what will actually be built. So, typically, where you might have two walls side by side, you can only test one wall, for example, or if you have a floor and ceiling, you can only test the, um, the testing uh, that you need to check against. Well, thank you very much for that. There'll be time afterwards, for, after we finish, to have a chat with some of the panelists. <coughs> but for the moment, I'd like to sincerely thank Deborah and Ger and John and Ian for their excellent presentations and for their engagement in the panel discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have now um, a short presentation by Barry McCauley. Um, if you would like to take your seats back again. Um, Barry is going to talk about the CETA strategic research direction. Is that right? Very good. Thanks, Neilan. Uh, Barry will be well known to, to many of you. He's a chartered construction project manager and full time lecturer in digital construction engineering within the School of Multidisciplinary Technologies at the new Technological University in Dublin. And after his PhD, he spent two years as a postdoctoral researcher on the CETA-led Enterprise Ireland funded BIM Innovation Capability Program. And he's had a lot of publications and papers to date. Um, and Barry works closely with CETA and with Alan as well. And we're delighted to have him here today to talk about the CETA's research direction. If it's coming up. <laughs>
Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief uh, conversation discussion here today. What the Construction IT Alliance, uh, where we're going with the research for this year, what we're doing, what we have done, and I want to actually discuss something that's quite interesting. It might be, uh, you know, it might gather a little bit of interest within the room about an initiative that's gaining a lot of traction throughout Europe uh, that Alan is involved in and that I'm uh, currently involved in as well. So just a, a brief note that the roadmap has been re-released. The link is up there, so if you want to access information, please do. The roadmap was rescinded just for a while because you're adding a new piece, and this new piece looks at the World Economic Forum and rolling that out and how it can be applied in Ireland and what the results mean. So uh, you can see the BIM adoption cycle and we conducted a study to see where we are in regards to that cycle there in collaboration, enable and motivation. So the results are there. I won't spoil them for you. So please go there and download that. The BIM in Ireland Umbrella Group had their first meeting. Uh, what the Umbrella Group is uh, uh, accumulation of the different professional bodies that represent BIM, such as the SSI, RAII, CIC, uh, Engineers Ireland, so forth, so etc. And we have meetings every month to just kind of offer a holistic environment to help spread uh, the combined message of what everyone is doing. So uh, messages this year at the moment from the RAI is that they're working with the CIC and they're feeding information back to the construction sector group on what the digital project should entail and the scope within it. So the CSG, uh, I think most of you know, are the construction sector group, and they've been established to provide information on construction reform for the public sector. So the digital project is part of that, and they see the national BIM roadmap as an element within that project. Further to that, uh, the NSSI have completed the ISO 965 Annex, so that's going to be released for further interrogation to the public by June. And Michael Early of the RAI is working with the Office of Government Procurement in regards to establishing standards to help with their BIM execution plans. Transport Infrastructure, Ar Transport Infrastructure Ireland have also gone to planning on their Metrolink. Their Lewis project is going to be using BIM. They've released an e-tender for a common data environment, as well as opening up a research portal <coughs> where they're inviting research proposals. The SCSI have announced a new co-chair to work with Dr. Apple Beaton, which is Hugh Nikolai, and they have worked with the Mirror Committee and they've reached out to the likes of the CIF to help work, and the RAI to help work in their documents from a quantity surveying perspective. As well as that, within their council, at their monthly meetings, BIM has now become a standing topic and it's discussed. So they're integrating BIM across all their activities. So it's gaining a lot of traction, as would be expected, and as we can see in this umbrella group is uh, working just to put across the message that, you know what I mean, like collaboration and what all these are doing together. One of the key things that we're going to work on this year, myself, Alan, and Professor Roger West from Trinity College Dublin, is we're looking at doing a state of readiness for BIM survey. And what that means is that I just don't want to do a survey of going to the BIM companies and saying, are you using BIM and then come back, oh, 90% of the industry are using BIM, which we know is untrue. So it's actually going out and getting a diverse selection of SME contractors, architects, engineers, mechanical, electrical, and really trying to get an understanding of where we are. In case, so we understand how we have to respond to a potential mandate coming down the future or whatever happens. I'd like to talk a bit further here today about the BIM Supporters Initiative. This is something that uh, Alan's involved in, and as well as that I'm starting to get involved in here. And this is from an organisation that originated from the Netherlands. So you might be asking, well, why am I talking about a company that originated from the Netherlands? Well, Building Smart International have recognised BIM supporters, and they're going to work on provide funding in order to expand their activities across Europe. So what exactly is it? BIM supporters offered a really affordable resources in regards to their compass, their secrets, BIM execution plan, how to become a BIM certified consultant. So anyone in this room can become a BIM certified consultant, which will open up more work to use. We are looking at trying to get an Irish database up and going, and BIM analytics. So I'm going to go into a couple of these, not in much detail, but I'll go into a couple of these, what services are being offered. 
So how it works, this is example the BIM compass. So you can go online now, use the BIM compass for your, oneself or for a company. It'll give you an idea of some of the gaps, where you're strong, where you're weak. And it'll also give you a selection of data that you compare compared to other companies. Uh, so it measures the level of BIM in your organization, provides valuable insights. And as well as you can hire one of the BIM consultants within BIM supporters organization who can come in and can help further drive the agenda, kind of sit down with you, go through the question in more detail and offer realistic advice about how you can plug those gaps. The BIM uh, execution plan generator, this is really innovative, I thought, uh, using algorithms. So you have about 12 sections, could be introduction, collaboration, goals. And the project manager would initiate the execution plan. They would send a link then to the rest of the organization. And then they would start filling in the same questions. And what it ultimately does then is at the end of this process, uh, at the end, sorry, at the end of this process, you'll get a BIM execution plan. And within it, you'll have the key areas that people agreed with. And it also will highlight the key areas where people disagreed. With that, you can start to understand, okay, this is where we're not making communication, this is where we're on, we're off, and you can decide about how to kind of ensure that people are on the same page in regards to your BIM execution plan. Also, it'll ask you questions to a level of detail, model few definitions, industry foundation class, and with that understanding, it'll help plotting graphs, and it'll give you kind of an analysis of where there's gaps and where people need an additional, uh, I suppose, help. So the great thing about this, if you want to go on now and do it, you can do that for free. All these tools are for free to a point, and then obviously if you want to get the professional version, it's only a small fee. Uh, do you have something called BIM Secrets? Sounds pretty groovy. And with that, you have, uh, I suppose, access to e-course modules. So I did the IFC one there the other day, and I went into what is IFC, module few definitions. And again, they're kind of short, snappy videos, and they're really easy to digest. So you, you know, I think the, the IFC ones are free, so if you've interest, have a look at them, and then obviously there's further information there. And then they offered your certified BIM consultant. So that the BIM consultant will have direct access to the scientific research team, access to open knowledge base, and have access to text paragraphs, infographics, user reports, and will have yearly meetings. So they'll offer a platform, and the consultant can use the information within the BIM supporters platform. So. Within there, you'll be offered a consultant's operation ma manual. You'll get further information about uh, BIM secrets, execution plan, how you can go into the company and train people in the gaps in the execution plan, as well as the BIM compass. So this is uh, an idea of the pricing behind it, the light and to the full. And a certified consultant can validate your BIM company, can make it possible to share your course, finalize execution plans, give an open BIM secrets workshop and answer your questions. So this is the map here, and as we can see that there are plenty of dots around the world of BIM consultants. We have one in Ireland, so uh, I think Alan is actually the only registered BIM consultant at the moment, so there's plenty of room there to expand on this. And as well as it's quite affordable, it's 89 euro for one year. While we wait for, I suppose, a more traditional Irish database to become available to us with BIM, this is maybe an alternative that we can look at if we want to advance our learnings. And it's, you know, obviously for SMEs that can kind of come in here and see that there's instant access to this information and it can help within their journey until obviously, hopefully, we establish our own initiative in that regard. Thank you very much and we look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks very much, Barry, for that, that strange thing to, to set the scene for the future of CETA's research and also the, the whole BIM engagement that we can all get involved in. Um, sounds like we need a few more consultants in that field in Ireland. Um, I'd like to thank again all our speakers this morning. Ian set the scene really well in terms, to, in terms of the housing supply and demand and the importance of modular construction in general. Um, John also then talked about the multidisciplinary environment that's required for, for improvements in the built environment, the safer ways to produce these items, off-site construction, and key to all this is, is the standards and assessment me method that Theory has developed, and I'll be personally very interested in, in following that journey. 
Um, he also talked about key stakeholder relationships, and I think that's, a, again, a theme today that we all need to go away and consider how can we collaborate with others to um, ensure that Ireland is, is going forward with this. Um, Deborah talked about the added value of modern methods of construction, and I think that's really important as well to consider, particularly when you're talking to clients who say, well, look, we do it this way because we're going to add value in terms of quality, productivity, safety, and these are very important. Um, it was very interesting to see the speakers who also brought in the videos, and it really brings it home to you how fast these things can, can be done at such high quality and productivity. And finally then, Ger and his um, presentation on Horizon and the off-site systems, is, it was fascinating. It was very amazing to see as well, in particular, how you can design and build something in care in Tipperary and then bring it all the way to Malta and have a, an excellent process, quality process there. So, so well done on that. And also in terms of achieving the BO ratings and NZ where needed. Um, it's all really important. And, and thanks again to Barry for, for pulling it all together again in terms of CETA's next step. It's been a really interesting morning and thank you all so much for your great engagement, lots of interesting questions. Um, I think I said to somebody earlier, in 20 years time, perhaps we won't be using the term MMC anymore. It won't be modern methods of construction. It'll just be, this is the way we do it. These are the current methods. And thinking of where we are in the building today, we look back and, and see how this building in its original iteration, how it was constructed, and um, that then was the modern method of construction. So we as humans are continually evolving, continually challenging ourselves, using technology where appropriate, and using other skills that we as humans can bring to the workplace, to construction, and to the built environment. Thank you very much again, and I hope you've enjoyed the day. Take care.